Well, welcome and hello to everyone. My name is Mo Ottstadt, and I am a brand new faculty member here at UAGC. Um, so I will be your host today for this session. A couple of pieces of uh, housekeeping. Um, by joining us today, uh, you acknowledge that this session is being recorded and will be shared with TLC related materials. Um, our microphones will be muted for the presentation, but we encourage you to post questions and comments in the chat. Also, we've enabled live transcription, so if you'd like to use it, please click on the live transcription button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And now, I'm pleased to present our presenter today, Jennifer Robinson. She's the program chair in the School of General Studies and a proud Associate Professor at the University of Arizona Global Campus. Uh, today's session, she will walk you through a framework from which you will can begin to build a, or revise your philosophy of teaching in an open access university. Um, she has lots to share with you that's interactive, so please have your browser ready for your on your phone to engage in some online polls. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to this presentation. I know you have many options to choose from, and I know it's been a very long day of some incredible information. So I'm glad you're here. Um, the very wordy title of this presentation has a very narrow focus. So while we move through the discussion today, I want you to consider how you can use all of this concept with a laser focus on how your feedback can be used as an instructional tool in an open access learning environment. We have a unique opportunity to leverage this piece of our teaching and learning cycle to build students' capacity for online academics. Additionally, think about the many resources that are available at your university that can be used in feedback to further build capacity and make online learning translucent and show that students can create their own line own online learning path. So the main goal of today's presentation is to share this model of building capacity in online students. But first, I'm going to deconstruct all of these pieces and then show how we can build them up together again to remind us of how our feedback practices as part of our pedagogy can narrow transactional distance and build hudagogy while using principles of andragogy. So hold all those vocabulary words tight as we head into a few questions. The first thing is, if you have your phone ready, could you please go to that space? I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, and tell me, what do you think of teaching adults, or when you think of teaching adults in an open access environment, you put that there. What words come to mind? What words or phrases come to mind? And we'll just wait a second here. When you think of teaching adults in an open access environment, what comes to mind? Any ideas? You can also drop that into the chat. Just give it another moment here. You know, sometimes it takes a minute to get into those QR codes. In fact, let me put it back up here. There you go. Oh, good. Coming in through the chat. So diverse learners. Absolutely. Diverse learners. Here we go. Oh, wow. Here we go. Transparency, time management, life experiences, autonomy, patience, purpose. Absolutely. These are lots of things that when we think of teaching adult learners, this is what comes to mind. Also, I want you to keep these in mind as we move through this framework on how these pieces fit in to understanding our students when we're giving them feedback. The next one, I have another one for you. What hidden curriculum? So when you think of these adult learners and everything you just said about these things in their lives, 
What hidden curriculum might be in the way of student persistence and success? Another QR code. Right, background knowledge. Super busy lives, mindsets. Let's see what's coming in here. Just refresh it. What hidden curriculum pieces might be in the way of student persistence and success? With that one, it took a few minutes to come through. So I'll wait a couple of minutes here. Well, not a couple of minutes, but you know what I mean. I'll just try to have some teacher wait time and be patient. the QR code. Let's see if I refresh it, if that works. Jen, I keep trying to use the QR code for the second question, but it brings you back to the first question. So we'll okay, right. So that's my might be why you're not getting as many responses for the second Thank question. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay, good, good. Well, sorry about that, but classroom culture, technology, those are some great things that might be in the way of student persistence. So we'll just keep moving on. And those things you were thinking of with the hidden curriculum, we will come back to those. So as we move through this short presentation today, consider how you might incorporate the following pieces of this model into a practice providing feedback in an open access environment with adult learners. Feedback is a foundational instrument we have in an open access higher education environment to support students' growth. So thinking of feedback as a way to build a job that must be done to an opportunity to help students grow. Through personalized feedback, online instructors have the opportunity to greatly influence their students' academic capacity and persistence. Also, as we move through this, now that we're at the end of day two, think about how the information we're learning today helps you meet some of the objectives that you set for yourself in day one of the conference. So transactional distance. Our students choose open access universities for any number of reasons. For example, students might be in a location that precludes them from going to an on-ground university. They may have responsibilities that just do not fit into the normal trajectory of an on-ground university. And there are many reasons why um, students choose this and the task remains to continually understand these students in the context of their own lives and how best to communicate with them for skill improvement. So while there's a somewhat definable distance in online education, it's the psychological and communicative distance that we must attend to, especially when providing feedback meant to build capacity, especially academic capacity. The very nature of online learning means that students and teachers are likely not in the same location, and to begin to understand the psychological distance, think of the old lecture halls in those traditional universities when we sat in 100 and 200 level courses where there were 100 to 500 students in an auditorium. I think my biology class had 350 students in the auditorium. But to narrow down that distance, there were multiple labs set up and we would meet with um, teaching assistants in labs of maybe 20 to 25 students. So while the psychological and communicative distance was wide between us and that main professor, the sage on the stage, we were that, that distance was able to be narrowed in those labs with our teaching instructors, our teaching assistants. Um, so in those large courses, the narrowing of the, that distance became the responsibility of the teaching assistants. Simultaneously though, students were responsible for bridging communication gaps and misunderstandings about content. The responsibility was on the student to ask questions and seek support. However, this is much easier to do in a face-to-face -face classroom where there's relatively immediate access to a content expert and your peers. 
Additionally, students are able to gain information and ideas for how to complete work, what resources they needed simply due to that, that proximal location with the teaching assistant and other students. So feedback there meant to build academic capacity for learning could be accessed through direct conversation, questioning, as well as overhearing or intentionally listening to what was going on around them in the physical space. So, okay, now we're going to talk about hudagogy. This is, so we've talked a little bit about transactional distance. Now I'm going to go into some of those smaller pieces of the framework. And this first one is hudagogy. And this is one aspect of online learning where the student must take an active involvement in reaching out to instructors, planning the learning week and building time into their schedule for schoolwork. When students attend an on-ground campus, some of this is decided, decided by the very nature of the system. They get from the course catalog, they know the dates and times of their courses, they know when they have to be sitting in a seat in a classroom to receive face-to-face -face information from their faculty member. They can also engage in close listening to be able to understand what's going on around them, maybe something they may have missed, but they have that immediate instructor response to help them. This is not entirely different from being an online student. However, much of this becomes very student driven. Unless there are synchronous portions to otherwise asynchronous courses, the student must determine when, where, and how long to study or to engage with studying. In this case, students must make a contract with themselves for how long they want to study, what times of the day, and how much needs to be accomplished in one sitting. While online learning has some fixed aspects to it, a student still has flexibility about when to attend their, their course on their own schedule. So being able to make these decisions about their own learning is a key aspect of hudagogy. This theory of self-determination in learning assists to explain the concept of how a student moves from being reliant on an instructor to how to support their own learning. And students who operate in a hudagogical paradigm have an increased capacity for determining their learning needs and work with instructors to increase their own capacity. As students build capacity for driving their own learning, they begin to predict what is needed and then can take action to gather resources or seek out more knowledgeable others to find needed sources of support. Of most importance though, those who are capable of engaging in self-determined learning continuously reflect on the learning process, communicate, and can transfer information from one course or one situation to the next. They also believe they can move forward. So students who have a high degree of hudagogical thinking can easily rely on their skills and sub-skills that they have already learned in multiple environments. When providing feedback then, it's helpful to build hudagogy in students through sharing resources, ideas, strategies, and our own expertise to help build capacity to drive their learning. So now we move to andragogy, which in this audience is probably something not new, but it's important to establish this in the framework of building capacity in students while using feedback as an instructional tool. Andragogy is developed by Knowles and then updated again in 2020 is an often referenced theory in adult education. And a key aspect of this concept is that adults take initiative and are self-directed. So from the lens of hudagogy, this makes complete sense. Adults should be self-directed and understand how to build their own capacity by reflecting on what they do and do not do. However, andragogy assume, also assumes that adults need support from more knowledgeable others. A guide nearby, such as an instructor, can offer support and guide learning instead of waiting for the adult learner to ask. This means that instructors, especially online instructors who operate from a distance, need to understand the interplay between hudagogy and andragogy and how this can be reflected in feedback. So Lindemann, and this is very dated in 1926, but it's a good point that adult learners change as they age, right? And it's essential to remember this since online courses can be multi-generational. So from the viewpoint of hudagogy and andragogy, um, 
there still remains a solid undercurrent of communication to narrow the communicative and psychological distance between the learner and the instructor. Um, while both are relatively independent, an instructor nearby or an adult learner um, should be available so that students can contact for questions. In a completely asynchronous course, there are many confounding factors that widen the psychological and communicative gaps between students and instructors. The most obvious is the asynchronous nature of the course. Um, if a student is an online learner, they've made this choice since they believe that this is the best place for learning that suits their needs and goals. However, they may not have considered the communicative and the psychological distance between themselves and their instructor and the potential need to carry out communication in an asynchronous format. So now we, we use our feedback as a way to bring translucence to the online course. Um, and that's one way we can deepen communication that narrows the psychological and communicative gaps. So social translucence, coupled with Anderson's interaction equivalency theorem in online learning communication are just a starting point to help faculty focus on the pedagogical and hudagogical aspects our communication has. While our ultimate goal is for students to enter into conversations with instructors about skills gaps, maintaining trans translucency with how to improve and mitigate skills gaps will be crucial and contributes to uncovering the hidden curriculum of online learning. So for a moment, consider how you make access to support translucent in your feedback. Based on your feedback, will students know where to go for support? Or as you are giving feedback, do you assume that students know where to go for support? Students may not transfer knowledge from one course to the next. So everything that, that learner may have learned in Gen 101 with all of the resources available at UAGC may not transfer to the other courses. So do your students in your course all enter your course with the same level of understanding? So if we think about UAGC, we have a track for students who enter with under 30 credits and a track for students who enter with over 30 credits. And a comment in a presentation earlier today was about how come some of our three and 400 level faculty are seeing specific challenges. And this was a great opportunity for the first year faculty to remind them that the skills we're teaching in first year are only learned by those who come in with under 30 credits or a specific amount of credits. Oftentimes students will come in and bypass that sequence because they're coming in with more than enough credits that they do not need those early courses. So then when those students are coming into your course, the students who have gone through that early gen ed sequence and the students who have not will come into your course with varying knowledge of the resources available at UAGC. So then when, those, then when entering our daily teaching, understanding this helps us bring light to the curriculum pieces that underscore skills gaps and misunderstandings where our students need support. So our ultimate goal will be, as Kozu and Atwell state, a personal learning environment for each student in our online course, but through a feedback cycle that builds hudagogy in the online learner. Okay, back to the framework. That was a lot of information to bring you back to this framework. So by combining the elements we've just covered, pedagogy, hudagogy, andragogy, social translucence, um, interaction, the interaction theorem, we can put all of these together in a framework that reminds us to use our feedback as a way to build capacity in our open access online students. So using transactional distance as a continuum that encapsulates many other features of teaching and learning, it is possible to begin building capacity in both students and teachers for building, for bridging transactional distance. Not building, that was a mistake, bridging transactional distance. Beyond the structure, dialogue, and learners in transactional distance, it's essential to include pedagogy, andragogy, and hudagogy. These three components have some bearing on transactional distance. So by using our feedback, as a pedagogical tool to build hudagogy in our adult learners, 
we have the opportunity to narrow the transactional distance that does not have to be inherent in online courses. So one more piece to this is it's helpful also to consider how we can validate students, their performance, and the understanding that feedback is meant to increase cutagogy. When Rendon first um, originated the validation theory, she was particularly speaking about first time, first generation, low income students who were returning to school. And this theory is meant to express how important it is for students to be valued as creators of knowledge, but also that they're already bringing a great deal of experience and skills with them to the classroom. And this helps to make them feel a part of the academic communi community while fostering personal development and social adjustment to the system that they have joined. So faculty through feedback as part of our pedagogy can be validation agents. In essence, validating what students are doing well, providing encouragement, faculty can support persistence and retention through feedback. So Rendon reminds us that feedback, that validation breeds a sense of worth, belonging, and builds confidence. So by changing the focus of student work into a lens of an academic bid, we can think of our feedback from the validation standpoint. A bid for attention is sent to you through discussions, journals, quizzes, assignments, um, Canvas inbox emails, signals, um, nudges, if you're part of the UAGC Canvas community. Consider how you use these bids, these academic bids, for validation and for opportunities to build students' capacity for online learning through using feedback pedagogy to build hudagogy. All right. So now that we've walked through the pieces of this continuum and put it all together in a model to remind us of how our feedback practices or pedagogy can narrow transactional distance and build hudagogy while using principles of andragogy, what comments or questions do you have? And I'm going to say this that I'm having technical issues, so I may not hear you, but please come online if you have something you want to add. I am happy to engage in the conversation. Yeah, translucence is so important to what we're doing. We want to make sure students um, know where to find what they need to succeed. Any other questions or comments? I'm just going to put this back. Those are all my notes on that screen. Jen, if I could jump in. Um, I'm yes. Really, I'm really enjoying this. This is great information as a new uh, faculty member here. And I'm really thinking about the hudagogy and the idea of the online students having that self-contract with themselves of how much time um, they need to put into their assignments. I'm just thinking about has have you or anyone in our group um, had any type of resources to at the beginning of the course to help them think about the that that self contract? Yeah, I know. In our announcements, we post well a couple of things. One in the announcements, we we tend to post okay, what's due Monday, what's due Tuesday, mm -hmm. what's due Wednesday. I often because I know. Um, sometimes one of the issues we see with students in first year is that um, they're still struggling to learn how to take notes in a way that's useful so that they can synthesize information. So I'll let them know if they need help with a note taking system. I have what I call a micro lesson ready to go. It's a five minute micro lesson about how to take notes, how to synthesize that information. Um, another thing interesting that we can do that um, was incorporated into Gen 102 that we have begged, borrowed, and stealed into Gen 103 information literacy is that our instructional designers can actually set up these checklists at the beginning of each week. And it's simply a drop down menu where you check on it. And um, it shows the student what's due on what days of the week. And so I think, and it's in this nice little compressed, concise space. And I think that's a really good nudge for students. Um, as to how to plan out their week. Great, thank you. Yeah. I know we're just about at time. I know I threw a whole lot of just academic-y speak out 
Um, this is the framework for a book that I'm just about published. Um, and it is about feedback and coming across these terms really just set this huge light bulb off. Uh, we talk about capacity building and skills building, but putting this the, these theories of hudagogy behind and social translucence and interaction equivalency theorem, putting all of those together, it was just like this big light bulb of, well, on one hand, duh, but on the other hand, okay, this gives me a whole new way to think about what I'm doing and seeing feedback as part of my teaching process instead of something I have to do every Tuesday. Thank you guys for coming. I know it's been a long couple of days and I know some of you in here are session hosts. So thank you for, for coming along. Well, Jen, you have a couple comments, some, um, some thank you comments in the chat and some appreciation if you want to accept all of that. Um, yeah, Lisa, th that's one of the things that was really interesting to me when I came upon the literature of looking at social translucence and hudagogy and pedagogy and interaction theorem through the lens of a multi-generational classroom. Because, I mean, how many of us have had students from 18 to 65 in a classroom? I think we could all raise our hands and say, that's a huge age range that we have. So really thinking about students coming in, not only are they different generations, have different backgrounds and, and different skills coming in, but also if you're teaching a two, three or 400 level course, it could be that the students have not had Dr. Handy's incredible Gen 101 course or the understanding of technology in Gen 102 or information literacy in 103. So the students who have been able to just kind of go over those courses, um, they're not going to have the, the deep knowledge of all of the university resources we have at UAGC. And we have an incredibly vast amount of resources that our students' tuition are paying for. So the more we, we help them see what's there and remind them that they're paying for these, whether they're using them or not, um, I think the better able we are to help them transfer that knowledge from course to course. I mean, I know I remember my doctor's appointments better if I have to pay a $100 fee for not showing up. So maybe helping them understand that... Um, they're paying for this, these resources, the tutors, the writing center, the, I mean, everything we have on in, at UAGC is just as comprehensive as on ground and sometimes more comprehensive. So um, being able to help all of our students bring light to all those resources can be done through our using our feedback as that social translucence tool. Right, Ali? So Ali says we should move from talking about girl math, which we all know the number of clothes we fold in a day, right? To student math. You're paying for these resources. And I emphasize that a lot when I do live learning, that they are paying for this, this these resources, so to use them broadly. All right. Well, all right. if you guys want to ever chat because I'm always open for a good chat and some tea or coffee. Always feel free to reach out to me. Um, we can continue the conversation. I will post liberally when the book is published in, I think it's March. Um, and this will be chapter two, I think the peer reviewer wanted me to move it to. So just a little humble bragging here, not so humble, um, but a lot of bragging. Well, thank you, Jen, for everything um, today. It was yeah. very informative and well put together. And I also want to thank Stephanie Adams. Uh, she was our tech host. Um, thank you. And to all of you in the audience for participating in today's session. Um, we want to encourage you to continue to attend our sessions. We have a keynote tomorrow morning called Call to Serve, Fulfilling the Responsibilities of Open Access, which takes place at 9, 9 a.m. tomorrow. Um, and we want you to enjoy the rest of the TLC. Thank you again, Jen. Take care, guys. Thank you so much.